Hello, my name is Julie Smith. I'm the Executive Director of the Identity Defined Security Alliance. And I want to thank you for joining us today. Our webinar is presented by IDSA member Observe ID. Cloud Infrastructure and Title Management 101, Understanding M Fundamentals for Effective Multi-Cloud Security Enablement. Before we get started, I want to mention a few housekeeping items. We are recording today's session, so please make sure to share the link with your colleagues. You can submit questions to our panel through the Q&A chat window. And lastly, if you'd like to earn ISC Squared CPE credits, there is a link in the portal where you can provide your ISC Squared member number, and we will submit participation in this webinar on your behalf. So before I turn it over to our presenters today, I want to provide a quick commercial for the Identity Defined Security Alliance. The IDSA is a nonprofit that provides thought leadership, expertise, and practical guidance on securing digital identities for technology professionals. Through community collaboration, the IDSA provides vendor neutral research, education, and best practices that help organizations reduce the risk of an identity related attack. Membership is open to identity and security vendors, as well as end user companies and practitioners who are committed to the vision of an identity centric approach to security. I encourage you to check out the website, idsalliance.org, for more information. So let's get started. We have a great panel planned today. I'm going to turn it over now to the moderator for today, Tom Malta, who's a customer advisory board for the IDS. Over Thank you, Julie, and welcome, everybody. Um, thanks again for joining us today. And we're going to be talking about cloud infra infrastructure entitlements management and how you can deploy that and use that in your organization. So we're very excited. We've got a great list of speakers today, and we're going to get right into it. So just for a quick agenda, um, we'll do some quick introductions, go around the room so you know everybody who's going to be on the panel and speaking. We'll cover the introduction to SIM and what it's about, why it's needed, etc. We'll then get into some really healthy panel discussion between the different panelists, talk a little bit about best practices, and then we'll wrap it up with some questions, um, hopefully that come in from the audience. So please feel free to submit those as we're, as we're going. And then we'll wrap it up with closing remarks. So just to start off, so I'm Tom Malta. Um, I've been a practitioner in the IM space for the last 22 years or so. And in the last year, um, I've now kind of gone on my own doing consulting and strategic advisory work for a number of different IM software companies as well as some clients. So I'll pass it over to Axe. Thank you, Tom. Um, my name is Axe Desai. I'm the CEO and founder of Observe ID. Um, I come with a information technology security background for the past 25 years. Happy to be here um, and looking forward to a great discussion. All right, thanks, Axe. And Kurt? Kurt John, uh, Chief Cybersecurity Officer, Siemens USA. Uh, mostly a cyber background, and I also um, work with a couple of nonprofits, including the state of Virginia, on innovation uh, and tech economy, driving the tech economy. All right, and last but not least, Raj. Thanks, Tom. Hey, everyone, good to be here. Uh, I'm here as a customer, a practicing customer, and uh, I'm the CIO and CTO at Team Rubicon, a nonprofit organization that uh, utilizes the same functionalities and you know the platform. Uh, again, my background is primarily software engineering, and uh, you know here we are. So, looking forward to this uh, conversation. Back over to you, Tom. All right, thanks, Raj. Okay, so let's get into it, guys, right? Um, <clears throat> so the not-so-basic basics of SIM. So what is cloud infrastructure entitlement management? Where did it come from, and why do organizations need it, right? Um, we're going to go around the table here, but I'm going to just lead it off. So I think in, in the last couple of years, right, as we've seen a lot of organizations now move into cloud, and then again, multi-cloud, we're moving a lot of things to these new environments, right, to these various different CSP providers. You may even be using a lot of software as a service vendors. You've got multiple IDPs out there. You've got a lot of moving parts. 
So identities now have exploded, right? No longer is it just human identities. Now we've got service identities, machine identities, and so forth. Um, and with the DevOps movement, with so much, so many things moving into cloud, and the entitlements of those identities moving into the cloud very quickly, um, it's become apparent that there needs to be more visibility on a more real-time basis, right? Um, for those that have been around in the space like myself, right, the old days of waiting until you do a, a formal attestation event, you know, every 90 days to find out that somebody's overprivileged are no longer, you know, today's uh, mantra, right? You really need to be watching your payloads coming in and out. You need to be understanding what those privileges are, um, and you need to be protecting it, right? So it's all about visibility. And so organizations now, as they start to move into multi-cloud in particular, as many of the audience knows here, right, each of the major cloud providers have their own IAM solutions. So they work differently, they privilege differently, and how privileged assets come in and out of those clouds and what access they get is a very big concern for CIOs and C-levels alike. So I want to open it up to the, to the audience, as, uh, to, I'm sorry, to the panel as well to chime in here. So actually maybe uh, we'll start with you. No, thanks, Tom. I, th I think you covered a lot of these uh, the buzzwords that, um, you know, around the CIEM. By the way, the CIEM also pronounced as Kim. I'm not sure if you've heard about, about that uh, pronunciation, but essentially to me, it's more of a framework, all right? It's essentially a framework for managing and reducing risk due to overprivileged entitlements um, in the cloud infrastructure, um, as you indicated, associated with human as well as the non-human identities. Um, and I totally agree that the last few years, um, we have seen an explosion in the expansion, expansions of the cloud um, utilizations. And especially with the pandemic, um, the digital transformations and migrations to the cloud has um, gone exponentially high. I was reading at one of the articles actually, um, researched by Gartner and indicated that 50% of the workload has been migrating to the cloud. That's pretty high, significant number. And especially with, um, with majority organizations that are moving into the cloud, eventually end up with more than one cloud. I and mean, that's just the reality of the like, maybe there are different reasons, whether it could be simply that they don't want to lock into a single vendor or could be utilizing the best of the breed technologies. Um, it can be a lot of different reasons. And so the challenge to um, to the observability or the visibility of entitlements, um, it's really important. And, and this is where exactly the CIEM comes into the picture because there was an acute lack of a platform that provides 360 view or complete visibility across the board. Yeah, that's awesome, actually. Thanks for that. And uh, Kurt and Raj, you guys want to add anything? Yeah, I'll, I'll say... Um... I like the idea of it being a framework and, and the way I see it is it's a cloud first solution to an issue that's plaguing many organizations, right? Which is the correct management of, of access granted to whether it's workloads, buckets, whatever the case might be data. Um, and so it being cloud first, I think it, it, it natively and easily allows, you know, users of the of whatever platform it might be to have real time uh, access and understanding to just how your users are provisioned and how that access is managed over time and the, and to me the key term there is real time um, visualization you name it um, I, I just love it just because it's a cloud first approach to a very pertinent topic yeah that's a great point right as opposed to something that might have been you know, build for on-prem and then migrate it to the cloud, Correct. right? I think that's yeah. Right. Yeah, and then, and then Raj, I know you're living some of this day-to-day, -day, so what, what are your thoughts? Oh, I mean, I have many thoughts, right? Like, you know, I'll share a couple here. I know we'll get deeper later. Primarily, you know, when you're thinking about our model is, you know, we're nonprofit, you know, obviously nonprofits have budgets, and, you know, obviously we have, you know, a lot of emphasis in, you know, cybersecurity, cyber breach, and all that, you know, comes in, you know, pretty, pretty handful for us, right? The first thing is always, you know, how do we protect the people we serve and protect the people who serve for us? 
And, you know, we'll get deeper into it, but also the byproduct that I've seen, the, the you know, other than just, you know, what, uh, you know, the folks here have been sharing in, in transparency and accountability and auditing availability of like, you know, real time monitoring, there's also this other aspect with operating cost savings, right? Basically the efficiency gain, you know, and also translates directly to, you know, how do you manage pool, you know, resources as well as cyber insurance. If you, if you notice everyone's, you know, getting into the cyber insurance nowadays and, you know, I'm telling you the cost has skyrocketed, you know, I'm looking at 35 to 40% increase just between the last year into this year. Yeah. How am I going to mitigate that? How am I supposed to get some credit back? It's, it's partly, it's, you know, the other reason is the seam solution is also helps us getting some of those, you know, attention where I go to AHT, our insurance broker and say, hey, we're doing all these things. You know, what can you do? You know, are we still at that high risk or threat? You know, can can you bring us down a little bit and making sure that you give us a better score? These are the things that comes with it. But again, you know, going back to the seam, you know, approaches, you know, the automation, the cost savings, plus, you know, getting accredited for taking care of, you know, infrastructure, uh, your platform is key in protecting it. And, you know, CM is, is one of those providers as well. Hey, yeah, Tom, awesome. um, if you don't mind, I would love to just chime in here. Like I see where you have a question, where did the seam came from? Uh, for those who don't really know, I think this, the concept of CIEM first came in, I think it up around late 2020 when Gartner brought this concept into the, um, into the limelight, to be honest, um, specifically to highlight the challenges with the overprivileged account and entitlements. So just wanted to add that. No, I think that's great, Axay. And, and you know, I can I can just share, you know, as a practitioner, you know, at my last place, I mean, we kind of stumbled upon it as well. Um, didn't really understand, you know, what it was about, uh, what was the need, why is this something that, you know, we need to be thinking about, right? And I think we all touched on various different reasons here. So I think that was awesome, guys. All right. All right, let's move to the next slide. All right, so we're going to get a little deeper now into what makes a SIM platform different than your traditional IGA or, or privilege access management PAM solutions, right? And identity governance and administration, for those who don't know what IGA stands for, but I always like to clarify the acronyms just in case. Um, so really, you know, just to start off, I mean, it's, it's a service-based model, right? Software as a service, right? So it's easy to deploy, implement, easy to manage. Um, cloud native, again, built purposely for the cloud and to be able to monitor it. And again, that last thing is to be able to provide visibility into what's running in your various different cloud environments, right? Real time through dashboards um, with alerting capabilities that allow you to act very quickly should something look awry, right? Or something doesn't look uh, normal. So just to expand on that. Again, we'll, we'll go around the panel. Maybe Axe, if you'd like to uh, chime in on that, please. Sure. So to me, um, the real difference between the CIEM and the traditional identity access management platforms, to me, when I look at the traditional platforms, they were more built um, to address more static on-premises environments. To, and the reason they started is to meet simply your compliance and regulatory requirement. While as we know in, in the cloud, statics doesn't really apply because you're constantly adding the environments, the resources, you're uh, removing it or migrating the workloads. And, and so I would describe cloud as much more dynamic than what we have traditionally seen, in, seen into our um, traditional on-premises environment. And so the challenges are different. So IAM and CIEM can actually coexist, to be honest, right? CIEM, the purpose of CIEM is not necessarily to replace an existing IT or, or a PAM solution because that's not the intent here. Um, and, and with the dynamic environment, the challenges are different that they're addressing because you need a constant monitoring. You really want to correlate your, um, your entitlements across, across the platforms, different cloud providers, and then optimize them. I think that's, um, and in that sense, the security has taken the precedence over the traditional compliance and that entry into the cloud world. So there's a quite a bit of difference between CIEM and, um, and the traditional platform, as you indicated, obviously the CIEM platform inherently they are 
software as a services um, usually supports multi-tenant um, implementations utilizing the um, latest and greatest technologies stack especially the microservices api schemes you talk about it that allows them to be more agile and meet the continuous changing requirements of today's world to be honest yeah that's awesome and um kurt or Raj, anything to add <clears throat> no i actually nailed it nothing for my side yeah i think you know from my end i would say that i'm, I'm the least experienced in in this field you know honestly guys i'm not going to claim myself an expert in this at all but what I've seen is, you know, the PAM solution versus the CIM. I think that the cloud first in adoption, you know, luckily we at Team Rubicon, we never had in hybrid solution or on-prem, but you know, we came in as a cloud. You know, we started the organization as a cloud organization, cloud enabled 100 percent But what I'm really seeing the benefit of the CIM basically is the scalability because of the the, the comprehensive, you know, uh, the configurations and all the policies in the cloud environment where it can analyze everything at the large, right? It really scales in that sense. Otherwise, you would not be having this type of capabilities as a PAM, right? That's something that I've observed in the past, but I'm seeing the benefit of CIM and the cloud environment as a whole and such. Yeah, that's spot on, Raj. Just to add, I mean, you know, for the audience out there, you know, each of these different CSPs and some of you listening, you know, what's what's interesting is that, you know, when we look back, you know, four or five years ago when cloud was just starting, right, and the large CSPs came along, a lot of companies went all in on one or the other, right? Maybe they were all AWS or all Azure or what have you. Today, what we're seeing more and more talking to C-levels um, is it's more about a hybrid environment, right? You, they're going into multiple different CSPs potentially because of business reasons, because of geographical reasons, um, BCP reasons, and or in, even pricing, right? And taking advantage of, hey, if I'm on my workloads over in Google one day, I can maybe move them over AWS for a cheaper cost at some point. They want that flexibility, right? Um, the other thing that's driving it too, I think, is the business, right? Where you might have the developers and the IT organization who loves AWS because you can get down to fine grain resource level and privilege it at that point, or as the people in marketing might love Google because of the analytics uh, engine and its power, right? And Raj, you touched on it too, in terms of the groups, roles, and policies of each are very different. And just one use case I can point out for the audience that we came across when we were looking at it. One of the things that was concerning us, right, when we started to go into the multi-cloud environment, in certain cases, some of the big CSPs have different structures in terms of inheritance, for instance, right? So you could grant a privilege or a group or a role or a policy at a certain level within that environment and not understand that the concept of inheritance actually pr privileges that identity to a bunch more other things that you weren't aware of, right? And it's not a good thing to find that out, you know, later, right? You really want to find that out in real time. So one of the things that SIM is able to provide is if you're monitoring a, a specific group role or policy that might be super sensitive and you know a set of actors, right, or administrators that own that, and suddenly you see a new identity hit that privilege, um, which you weren't expecting, right? All of that happens in real time, and I think it's a real good benefit to provide that level of transparency, right? All right. Let's move on to the next page. I'm going to let... Um, actually take you through some of this. Um, sorry for dogs in the background if you're hearing them. Um, the benefits or the disaster of working from home. But this came from Gartner and it actually um, shows some of the differences between the different tool sets within uh, identity um, software that's out there. So actually maybe you wanna take us through this on a little bit deeper level. Sure. Um, so in, in essentially we have come to know various terminology with regards to uh, the cloud security uh, posture, right? I mean, we keep hearing about um, cloud access broker. We talk about the uh, cloud workload platform and we talk about the CIM, which is cloud um, infrastructure entitlement. In, in organizations and the security professional, to be honest, get, are getting confused. Well, what do I need? Do I really need all of them? Do I need one of them? How do I determine which one do I need, essentially? 
And so all of these various concepts and the platforms that came into the limelight in the last few years, the purpose of it is to address the cloud security. Each one of them are addressing a specific niche area, as you see that, right? And, and what organization needs is really drives what is the requirement, what are they looking for, right? Um, essentially, at the end of the day. And if you look at the functionality and the features, Gartner has pretty much identified what is minimum that's expected from the platform that you're looking for. So if you're looking for CIEM platform, well, what are the minimum features that a CIEM platform must have? And the three unique features, as you see here, highlighted in a different color, is entitlement correlations, entitlement visualizations, entitlement optimization. So what are these things, right? What is entitlement correlations means? So as Tom indicated before, the different CSPs has a different IAM model. That's, that's just the given. You're using Microsoft or um, Google Cloud or any of those, they all follow their own IAM model. And so organization really needs a way to correlate these accounts and entitlements across the cloud platform, to be honest. And that's the whole purpose of, of utilizing the CIM, which correlations essentially helps normalize um, or actually unified some sort of a unified access model that you can apply across across the platform. So that's the purpose of the, the correlations. The visualizations, as we talked in the beginning, the traditional uh, platforms, they do visualizations in a tabular format, but as, as soon as you start migrating to the cloud, you're dealing with thousands of resources. One, one of the research articles that I was reading, uh, one of the major um, cloud provider added something in range of 30 different resources just in a single year that tells you the speed of number of resources that are getting added by various cloud providers and so the number of accounts number of entitlements has gone up significantly much higher and so looking in a tabular format is no longer practical um, and so the visualization in a graph format or mind map has become very optimal as soon as you start talking about the cloud and so that's another differentiator of, of CIEM platform. And then entitlement optimizations. We have been talking about real time. I heard the real time multiple times in these conversations, right? So observing real time, who has what access, what's happening in your cloud infrastructure, it's extremely important. Um, user behavior and analyzing the data that you collect through your operational activity and somehow correlated utilizing your either um, AI, ML, or some sort of an um, you know, intelligent engine, which can help you to determine and help you to enforce list privilege um, across the cloud is all about optimization. So these are the three unique functionality or the feature I would say that CIEM basically presents. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Actually, thank you for that. And just to add, and hopefully, you know, the audience um, really loves this slide. I think it's a great way that Gartner kind of looked at, you know, the entire identity landscape and said, okay, let's kind of see how Sim or maybe Kim, as you pointed out, actually is in a different pronunciation, um, is different than your typical software that people are deploying, right? Whether it's PAM, IGA, or what have you. Um, I think you know those two, three, and four items that are highlighted is really key, and hopefully that's resonating with the audience, right? It's really about making sure you understand what's happening on a more real-time basis, right? And not getting it after the fact and correlating those entitlements and seeing that visualization, if you will, uh, in a dynamic, you know, real-time environment is really what's going to help, I think, customers and organizations manage that access better, right? And so that's you know, from my perspective. I know, Kurt Arise, would you, would you like to add anything before we move to the next slide? It's hard for me to top that. Um, so, no, I'm, I'm actually pretty... Um, I think when you look at all the, all the numbers, one through, what's that, 19, um, very important topics. But when it comes to a compliance um, and just real-time uh, awareness, of how you are managing your entitlements, um, you can't be two, three, and four. I mean, it's just it's just phenomenal to be able to do that in real time. Because uh, as you know, at least speaking from a security perspective, 
Um, the quicker you're aware of things that might be misconfigured, the better chances you, you have of preventing unauthorized access. And then um, in my previous life, when I used to do auditing, um, two, three, and four would also be like a slam dunk for compliance as well. So it's, 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 it's good. It's interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from our perspective here, I'm going to emphasize what XA shared earlier. The, the 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 key the key part of this this the, the theme is principle of least privilege, right? Obviously, we all know that, and that's what the CIM, in my mind, I think, allows us, or at least Team Rubicon enables Team Rubicon to actually help us defend potentially anything that data breaches or whatever that malicious attacks, some level of layer, and then you know you add that the real time aspect to it you know you just you just have to have it i think in my mind it shouldn't you know having a non you know non-profit is the last thing that we think about right the cim and security and all that honestly you know if you bootstrapping if you cash strapped you know you constantly you know asking for donation for the cost for the mission it's hard it's a hard sell you know when i go to my my sponsors and my donors and my executive peers and like, hey, you know, can we allocate some budget? Um, you know, I want to up the the uh, security here and, and uh, having a multi-layer protection here. And they're like, you know, what are we getting in return? We, nobody knows until we get really, you know, into this bad area, bad actors coming in. And Team Rubicon, and unfortunately, I don't know if it's a blessing or not, but, you know, we have gone through, you know, numerous attacks in the past that has made it easier for, for my case. But, you know, honestly, the list here, I'm going to sum it up. You know, it's, it's really simple. It's principle of least privilege that is enabled by the CIM solutions. That's key here. Great. Thank you, guys. All right. And, Raj, it's a good segue, um, I think, into our next slide. Um, so, Raj, I know you were an early adopter of, of SIM and would love for you to, you know, take control here and tell us a little bit about Team Rubicon what were mm -hmm. some of the challenges that you guys faced? You know, why were you looking at a, at a SIM solution and how you determined um, is that that's what you really needed? So turn mm -hmm. over to you, sir. Well, thank you, Tom. I, you know, I'm hoping I'm not going to bore you guys to death here. You know, I just wanted to kind of flow into this, you know, the content, the next slide. So bear with me, folks. Um, you know, I want to introduce, introduce Team Rubicon. This is kind of a, you know, the backdrop I get. I always use this because it pretty much signifies what we do and where we are, what we do daily, right? And Team Rubicon is, it's a small nonprofit organization and we go where no one wants to go. And it sounds cool, but, you know, a lot of times we find ourselves in trouble. Like currently we are deployed in war zone in Kyiv, uh, Mariupol, in Ukraine. I mean, it is that's how it is so we deploy medical teams uh, all across uh, globally um, a lot of times in austere for the most part 95 99 percent of the time we are operating in austere condition that means no infrastructure everything's knocked out pretty much no internet no electricity no water and that's you're going to definitely i guarantee you you will find team rubicon and you know as a whole team rubicon is a global humanitarian disaster response organization we 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 are kind of unique. We are built, uh, you know, with a veteran-led uh, team. 75% um, of our team members are vets. And also first responders, policemen, you know, fire department, firemen, uh, EMT uh, folks. People just come, you know, from these different various uh, experiences. And plus, you know, kick-ass civilians. So you you blend this group. It, it's an awesome team, right? So we we're known to rapidly deploy that's key here when i say rapidly you know in any event when you're thinking about suffering when you're thinking about something just took place it takes time to process that has that or event you know might that be a refugee situation um you know folks you know community being displaced because of disaster um earthquake and haitian you know earthquake or bahamas there's the hurricane Dorian, uh, Hurricane Harvey, and you know, you name it, like Puerto Rico, you know, uh, Maria, and we're there, right? But it's key for us to be there as soon as possible. And you know, it's the model is the same as fire department. But to get there, we need systems that's efficient enough. Technology enables Team Rubicon to do that. 
we're not great, but we do something better, something you know even better than others, right? We we are very nimble. We operate in small groups, but we do a lot of things. We assess the situation and we call for other unmet need helps, like Red Cross. You know, we we call on other operating partners. So we pretty much like to be very, very, very agile. So that's kind of our model. And the other thing I want to share is we are only about 170 people, staff, employees. That's it, right? But who really drive the, the business is volunteers, our you know, fearless volunteers, 150,000 of them, right? And growing to date, right? They're the one who run our business. And this is all for them. This is all to enable them to do their work, to be efficient. And how can we do that? It's, it's a big feat for us. So this is kind of the, you know, the, who we are and how we operate and what we do kind of thing. So I'm going to move on to the next slide here. Our challenges um, has always been, you know, when you, when, we, when you put somebody, you know, volunteers, they come to help, they sign up, they, they take PTO, they, they, you know, they leave their family behind and just to spend time, you know, to, the, to do the good work on the field. You want to make sure you treat them as your customers, right? To us, volunteers are our customer, the survivors are our customers, and our, our donors are customers. We have three core customers that we serve. But it's important for us to make sure that our volunteers have the best experience, easy enough for them to be on the field. And end of the day, they get a handshake or a hug, right? Because they want to go there and you know be impactful. <clears throat> that puts a lot of burden on our system. Here's why. Volunteers don't, are not bounded by any of our employee handbook or policy. Okay, that's a risk for us. That means if they violate anything or any security policy or any systems, you know, they're not liable. We are liable. So how do we protect our system, our network, and our folks and identities and all that good stuff? So, but they still need to do their work. They need to do the good work out there. So the back back office functionality, the administrative functionality, mobilization functionality, training the volunteers to get out there. How do you talk to you know the people you serve? You know how do you be you know kind of interactive? How do you take data in? What type of data is safe? What is not safe? Can you use a thumb drive? No, you cannot. Can you carry a laptop? What type of device you take out there? All this comes and becomes you know high risk. Most of our team travel overseas. We block traffic overseas. So just like the credit card fraud, fraud team does, you know, hey, call in your credit card company, tell them that you're traveling to Southeast Asia. We will enable that. So this is the same policy we apply. But then, you know, the accountability, the accessibility is key, right? We have to provide the volunteers and the volunteer leaders, we call them professional volunteers, just enough access, just enough privilege to carry out the day-to-day -day tasks. Because we're not there. We are very small. As staff, we just can't monitor every one of them, what they do. Volunteers come for two days, two weeks, two months. It all depends their time. But we have to enable them. So we have this concept of a library resource pool because we have to uh, provision and deprovision them on demand, real time. So all this needs to be you know, automated. I mean, we are a big Microsoft shop as well, and they don't really like to hear that we use the library concept because they're not making money, you know, in, in, li in licensing. But we have this concept of like, you know what? It has to be fair for somebody to come in and, and do this work. When I say work, we're talking about communication. We're talking about asynchronous communication, resources and files, guidelines, you know, and then also step through process, the systems that go through phase after phase and, you know, updating reports and all that. These people who come in, they have to be part of that uh, life cycle of what they do. Even if they come in for a day, they have a role given to them. What is their role? A today, Raj or Tom will be doing, who will be handling all the logistics in the field in the forward operating base, you know, in Oklahoma, right? Or in, 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 in you know, in right by the bank of, you know, Mississippi River. It doesn't matter wherever we we put our stake and we open an operating base and that's where everything happens we throw in a satcom we throw in the satellite dishes you know internet is up and running with you know four megs per second i mean it's not fast but we have to get things done this is where it really challenges us in in terms of operating in the field how can you keep being efficient and being there for the people who really need help on their worst day 
but be mindful of you know protecting your assets your infrastructure and that's always been a kind of you know tug of war and this is where it comes in where you know tools like observe id you know systems like observe id and the seam in general the frame really helps us uh, help enable us you know in in a nutshell it's pretty much what we've been discussing you know since the start of the webinar the talk here continuous monitoring access detection easy onboarding offering this is big for us we cannot have or we can't afford someone sitting behind and just enabling access someone's in ukraine someone's in africa in somalia these are our team members that need just on-demand access and we deprovision them so all this needs to be automated but yet need to be monitored close enough right that that's key for us and then the the ease of like you know and i've heard somewhere like the privilege the the group privileges the policies all that is important for us we have designed one thing that we have done well in the organization is every single role has been very well defined in what type of roles and privileges they're going to get and that's baked into the policies that enables our our system to be automated enough so what we do is we do assign you know the the dashboard the, you know the configurable the analysis all that comes in one place so we're able to monitor all that right and it's so effective honestly guys i mean it's a big you know big cost efficient you know you know cost saver for us as well as you know it adds two to three layers of security for us and it enables us to talk to our insurance providers saying that hey look we're taking all this you know mitigative steps you know what can you do can we get a little more discount on our policy i mean i tell you right now it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars every year now it has gone up for us just for the you know cyber policy i'll pause there uh if there's anything that i may have missed or any questions hey raj i thought that was awesome so thank you for that summary and i think just thank you to team rubicon right and what you guys do and all the volunteers in the company i mean you guys are living you know day to day if you will with lots of issues across the globe and uh you know just a shout out and you know thanks for all that you do so i think that was awesome thanks well, thank you all right great and we will now go to kurt is going to talk to us a little bit about siemens uh, and i'll be i'll be super quick because some of the questions that have come in here are so interesting i want us to get to those as quickly as possible including raj probably a call back to you because someone wanted to know specifically how um, Seam helps to, to reduce your costs or get you cost savings. So Siemens, um, a focused technology company that's on the edge, like IT, OT conversion. So you can think, um, and maybe I'll give you some really cool statistics and examples to show you the spaces in which we operate. Um, we have about 50,000 people in the U.S., about 200,000, 250,000 globally. And we're in everything, uh, health, uh, healthcare, energy, transportation, we build trains, mobile train platforms, et cetera. Um, about 30% of the energy that's produced in the U.S. is done through Siemens equipment. Um, about 95% of the mail that's delivered is done through Siemens equipment. Um, about 90, 95% of the baggage is the bags that move through airports and about two-thirds of the airports in the U.S., Siemens equipment, and so much more, um, factory automation, et cetera. So um, the mission is good, really cool. A little bit about Siemens, um, three primary verticals dealing with smart infrastructure, grid edge, digital technologies, and, and digital platforms. Uh, and, and trains, transportations, and so on, logistics, et cetera. We're definitely a multi-cloud environment. We have some that use Azure, some that use AWS. We even have a little bit of Google Cloud sprinkled in there. Um, and, and we, in general, are a cloud-first um, company as we continue to transition. It's a 200-year-old company. So as we continue to, to transform into a focused tech company, um, cloud plays a, a major strategic role in that. Uh, and I'll leave it at that with Siemens because I am digging these questions. So go ahead, Tom, back to you. All right. All right. Thank you, Kurt. Um, so we have a couple of um, questions we wanted to go through with the panel, and we do have some coming in in the chat. So thank you all. So keep them coming. So the first one here is just, you know, you know, this has been around for two years now since Gartner introduced it. Um, you know, some people are skeptical, you know, is this, is this a new buzzword? Is it here to stay? 
Uh, certainly want to get the panelists' viewpoints on that. I'll, I'll certainly kick it off. I think I'll be first to admit, you know, when I first heard about it a couple of years back, um, when I was at Navy Federal, I, I wasn't really sure what it was about. I'm like, you know, is this another new thing? You know, why do we need it? You know, I don't really understand. And as we started to look into it, and as we've alluded to on this call today, I think making sure you understand in real time what's happening in your cloud environments, you know, particularly as you're going into multi-cloud is really important. So I see it as a, as a, a differentiator to existing offerings. And as I think I actually took you through that one slide in terms of how Gartner positions SIM against the other identity products, hopefully it was obvious to the audience that there were some things that call out that the other identity products aren't doing, right? Um, and I think it's important, depending upon where you are in your journey, you know, to, to start looking at, you know, potentially taking advantage of a SIM solution, again, particularly if you're multi-cloud. Um, but certainly, Akshay and Kurt and Raj, just would love to hear your thoughts as well. Yes, I'll go first, Tom. So I completely agree. I really believe that CIM um, came, however you want to pronounce it, here to stay, to be honest. Um, journey to the digital migrations or digital uh, moving into the cloud journey is just in, you know, still in the infancy, to be honest. Not a lot of majority of the organizations are still figuring out. And, and multi-cloud is here to stay. Um, and in the pro organizations who are just honing on into a one single cloud, it's still important for them to look at CIEM simply because the built-in policies that we've seen, we talked about the various CSP utilizing different IAM models. In fact, there was another research that I was reading it a few weeks ago, indicated that the built-in policies that comes along with the, uh, you know, with the, with the IAM policies from the major cloud providers essentially grants two and a half times more entitlements than what are really actually required. And, yeah. and so that in itself is very critical and kind of indicates that CIM is here to stay, unless we think that the cloud is not going to be there, right? So it's essentially yeah. is here um, as far as I can see, <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Kurt or Raj, anything to add? No, nothing from my side. It's it's definitely here to stay. Yeah, I mean, I'd yeah. agree with, with the team here. Honestly, is there an alternative other than the legacy approach, right? In terms of the cloud, we've seen it. We got into a, and I know we got a year and a half or two years robbed of us because of COVID. We all stayed home. A lot of us stayed home. What, it, what, huh. what happened? Everyone went asynchronous. Everyone went Teams and Zoom. Uh, blue jeans and all that everything's on the cloud right that has spiked the need to to protect those networks the infrastructure that actually a growth that no one anticipated and companies scrambled to provide access and privileges and all this and that means scalability right it it needs to be adaptive to that scale scalability factor and this is what we have witnessed in the last two years Everything has just gone up because of the cloud. The cloud's proven now, right? Before that, everyone's like hybrid or, you know what, I'm not ready. Now the cloud is there. It's just a new new world, new age. I mean, we're not going backwards. You know, what my question to the team here, the panel, all the folks listening is what is the alternative? Right, exactly. And I think what's interesting is um, just relating it again from a practitioner perspective in the past, you know, when something new comes along, right, or even if you're driven from a regulatory reason in a highly regulated environment like financial services where I've spent most of my career, um, you're constantly adapting to change, right? And sometimes the business is pushing for one thing and, you know, the CIO is trying to make the business leaders happy and they want to really move into Google right away or into AWS or what have you. But the right time for this isn't necessarily once you've got a mature multi-cloud strategy, you know, already baked. Um, people would argue that point and say, hey, Tom, you know, I'm really just starting out. Do I really need a SIM? You know, why don't I wait until I'm um, two or three years into it? Well, I mean, as, as some people realize, right, and many know on this call, I think that might be too late, right? Meaning in terms of you know, you're overprivileging people, you really don't understand what the privileges are doing in each of the cloud environments, and you're putting 
the firm at increased risk. I mean, if you can start to mature as you're going into the cloud, bringing in a SIM solution and making it part of your cloud strategy, in my opinion, is that that's far more advantageous than waiting until you're fully adopted, right? And I think what we've heard from panelists here, I think people would agree. So awesome discussion. Um, one more point I just want to highlight, I think the IDSA and industry groups like it, right, creating best practices and helping set the vision for things like SIM. Um, as a member of the SIM working group, how has ID benefited from its membership? Certainly want to open this up to the panel. I would just say as a as a proud member of the IDSA for several years now, um, I'm a real believer in the organization and what it brings to the identity ecosystem, right, bringing both software companies and practitioners together, right, to solve common identity problems. Um, and through the technical working groups and the things that we have done over the years, I think we have started to really make a difference and people are seeing that. Um, so I'm certainly a huge fan of it. Um, but certainly, actually, maybe start with you just to get your thoughts on this as well. No, I agree, Tom, what you said. I, I think, you know, um, as we have indicated before, um, I believe that CIEM is still in infancy. And so bringing the like-minded professionals and the groups into the same platform, working on a longer term benefits and defining the frameworks and the best practices is extremely important. So I really appreciate what IDS has done, um, being a nonprofit and, uh, and you know, but not vendor agnostics, bringing all these professionals and putting this together that's going to be around. We're very happy to be part of it. Awesome. Thank you. And, and Kurt Raj, anything to add? Huge believe in associations across the board. So anytime there's an association that brings um, like-minded individuals or um, companies together for the greater good, I, you know, triple sign. So it's good. Awesome. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, and just to kind of wrap up with this slide, and then we're going to get to questions and answers, and we've got a couple great ones teed up. Um, so just to really, to, to, and again, we'll go around the panel real quick to, to get, let people chime in, but really just education around SIM best practices and standards and things that we're trying to emphasize here today on, on this webinar. The importance and need of visibility of identities, right? We've given the, the audience several examples now, right? And making sure you understand the different ways these cloud environments are permissioning your actors coming into the cloud environments, right? And your actors are people and there are non-human machines and services and other things that you're deploying in the cloud. Um, and getting the visibility and the transparency of that in a real-time environment in a cloud-first product, right, is really important to make sure that you're, you know, defense in depth, right, you're protecting the organization. So it's another tool in your toolbox to protect the organization, much like some of the other IAM tools that you might already have. You know, and again, taking a deep dive into the permissions and privileges and access that you're deploying there, make sure you understand what's moving, how it's moving. Is the concept of inheritance possibly in danger, as we've alluded to several times on this call, right? You don't want to find out about that after the fact, right? You really want to understand that going in as you're moving and deploying, whether it's sec DevOps or DevOps, right? Things are moving very quickly into the cloud multiple times a day. Um, and understand who those actors are and what those privileges are doing. And just continuously mapping and monitoring, right, at all, at all the time is really what this is all about. But um, Axe, anything, or from Kurt or Raj, if you guys want to add anything? No, I think it's just a high level, uh, you know, again, the visibility, ability to, um, to detect anomalies and respond and immediate to those, um, those anomalies. I think those are the three the components of um, the best practice, to be honest. Awesome. And and Raj, just to call on you for a minute, I know you've been living this day to day. I mean, would you echo this in, in terms of what you guys are seeing and, and kind of the importance from your perspective? Absolutely. Right. And we've seen in many variations. I mean, I tell you right now, we have back, bad actors, not just internally, but they don't mean it. It's most of the time it's not intended. Folks just want to get down to the field and do the good work. Right. Uh, security is the least thing in, on their mind. Right. Um, but, you know, we all know, we all agree that the, the, the weakest link in the whole cybersecurity and all security threat and all the rest is just the human being. 
part. You know, we're the one. Somebody's, you know, got this back door open somehow, or they let something you know, in, in in terms of oversight. But it's not intended unless they are actually bad actors. But we've also had a fair share of bad actors where we got DDoS multiple times. You know, during peak hours of you know fundraising. I mean, there are people like that, that actually take down a nonprofit organization trying to do good in the worst time ever. But you know, just to bring it back here is we are trying to stay ahead of these risks and how do we get there in you know having a a, a multi-cloud tool such as the seam practice the framework and you know solution to gather this and put all this information together on all identities and services it is a big deal for us right all in one place and that's that's key you know, to get that com complete picture and also identifying the gaps in security potentially that what we have missed, may, may have missed or overlooked that also surfaces those, 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 those elements. So that's key, right? And to answer your question, yeah, absolutely. And we're still early uh, in adoption and we know we're going to get creative with, with the framework here, with the solution. And I know that we're going to identify many more new use cases that's going to be equally benef beneficial to uh, to the community here. Awesome. Thank you, Raj. All right. And now we're going to get to some Q&A. So we've had a bunch of good questions come in. Um, I'm looking at a couple different ones. I'm going to kind of summarize a few of them together because uh, there's some questions around, you know, can it work by itself? Um, does it work in conjunction with IJ and PAM and so forth. So a good summary of it, is SIM a standalone solution or does it work in conjunction with other solutions already in place in terms of what you might already have deployed uh, across your identity management program? So if you've got PAM and IGA, is this something that comes in and works alone? Is it something that comes in and works with them? Um, I'll just start it off and then we'll open it up to the panel. I think my perspective, again, as a practitioner in this space for so long would be really understand where you are in terms of the maturity of what you've deployed, right? Um, if you're an organization that's just starting out with identity access management, you don't have anything. Um, certain SIM solutions offer more capabilities than others, right, as you saw from the Gartner slide. So in terms of some overlap, um, if you have nothing, right, you could potentially go with a very robust SIM solution that gets you further along in terms of some of the other things that you might want to do in terms of your strategy. Um, if you're a more mature shop, maybe you've got PAM and you've got IGA already rolled out, and now you're aggressively looking at your cloud environment, you know it's a risk, you're trying to figure out, hey, what's another layer of defense that I can add? This is a great add-on, right, to what you're doing there. So that's, again, from my perspective, but uh, open it up to the panel here, and actually maybe you want to lead us off again. Sure. No, I completely echo what you just mentioned, right? So it all depends on when, where the organizations in their identity security journey, right? So if they're just starting out and they don't really have any of the solutions, there are platforms out in the marketplace that can, that essentially integrates all of this concept, including the IGA onboarding, offboarding, the PAM solutions, which includes essentially just in time provisioning, auditing, password locking, et cetera, et cetera including the CIM functionality that we've been talking about for the past one year. But if you are a mature organization and if you already have these platforms in place, there's no need to replace, the purpose of CIM is not necessarily to replace any of those existing platforms. And, and yes, the vendors do, the CIM platforms um, do integrate with the existing service providers that provide IGA as well as a PAM. So it, it all depends on where, uh, where you are. Great. And Kurt or Raj, anything to add? No, nothing from my side. Okay, you're good too, Raj. All right, awesome. Um, okay, so another question we had um, was around some of the capabilities that make one SIM vendor stronger than the other. I think we just talked a little bit about that, right? I think um, in terms of what you saw from the Gartner slide, there are going to be different capabilities in each of the products that's a, that sort of support this space, right? So again, kind of understand what you're going after, as you just alluded to. Um, if you need identity governance and you need privilege access, and maybe 
um, you're a middle-sized organization, right, you might be okay, right, looking at a SIM provider that provides some of that capabilities, and that gets you pretty far along. Um, again, some uh, larger, mature strategic organizations, you know, might just be looking at SIM strictly for what it does in terms of the visibility aspects of what it provides. Um, another question we had was around, we'd like to know specifically how SIM could help with cost savings in the cloud. I guess from my perspective, what I would say is um, there's a couple things here, right? Um, one is I think it's more about, in my own personal view, I think it's more about risk management, right? And again, defense in depth of being able to provide that extra layer of transparency. First and foremost, as you're in the cloud and you're actively managing these credentials and you want to understand them. I think from a cost savings perspective, perspective you could look at it from a couple of different ways, right? One is um, kind of what we just alluded to. If you purchase a SIM tool that's actually more robust and gives you more of the other types of identity capabilities, there could be some cost savings there by purchasing a product that gives you a lot more. So that's one way to think about it. Um, another way, when we talk about cost, right, it's not just cost of software, it's cost of people and, you know, mitigation and so forth, right? So I think by having a SIM solution in place, right, you're going to reduce some of your risk, which inherently could bring down some of your cost, right? So I'd love to open us up to the panel. Any other thoughts uh, on that question? The only thing I would add here, um, Tom, is is automations, right? Increased productivity. I mean, CIEM does right. bring a lot of automations, especially uh, with regards to um, managing the user entitlements and privileges. And so that bring, increases the productivity. And Raj alluded to, um, for example, a simple case, insurance, right? Um, it helps um, with right. your insurance payment, um, obviously productivity. Again, these are not the primary reason you would implement CIEM, I, I, you know, I concur with what you just said, it's, it's all about risk management. Imagine what happens if you don't have some, uh, you know, some similar platform and you do get, um, get hacked. How much amount of time and money that you're going to spend, not only trying to work with your insurance, the man hours collecting the additional evidence, potentially you are locked into for months and months. You cannot really do it. I know the organization that gets hacked are completely locked for months uh, while they continue to work with their um, insurance and other um, consulting organizations trying to identify. And they still don't get the answers at the end of the day, to be honest. So I think that's the most critical component of it, along with other benefits that comes along with it. Yeah, yeah I agree with on. that, Tom. And I say, you know, sometimes I wish I could turn the clock back to, you know, I would tell you that we we got hit with a major DDoS by some hacker um, during the Hurricane Harvey response, and that's the the critical time, folks. I mean, we were fielding you know, you know a lot of donation right to to actually um, increase our response, and you know basically at that time everything went down, and oh. I kid you not. <laughs> I joined Team Rubicon a month before that. I had no idea of any blueprint of you know what the infrastructure looked like. We had multiple shadow IT going on, so there's there were multiple SaaS systems uh, run by each department. So I was just coming in new, and this hit, and everyone's just looking at me. You know, Raj, what are you going to do about this? We need to keep making money because this is a very short window. What do you do? Right. right? I had no idea. We didn't have any SIEM solution. None of that stuff. Right. But then we also see that our fundraising team is like, hey, this this is important. We're potentially losing millions and millions of dollars in donation coming in. And what did I do? I had no choice but to shut everything down. I did not know how far the hacker got. No idea. Right. What was the journey behind it? What was the motivation behind it and the intention behind it? So because they were exactly. connected multiple uh you know SaaS systems i had to shut each of them down and really pull through some you know couple of days investigation i'm i tell you one thing i was the most hated guy the whole organization during that time <laughs> welcome to i am man That's right. <laughs> right. Uh, we could spend a whole other webinar on that one but i know we're at one minute um and i'd want to wrap it up i don't know if we got to all the questions and apologies if we didn't feel free to reach out to us afterwards uh, I just wanted to thank the panelists for the robust discussion today. Thank the audience for joining us. Um, again, feel free to contact, uh, contact us afterwards. And uh, we thank everybody for participating today. Have a great day, everybody. 
Thank you. Thank you.